All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys, introducing Kyle Anzalone, news editor at the Libertarian Institute and opinion editor at antiwar.com. Welcome back to the show, sir. How are you? Doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely happy to have you here. So, uh, man, you've got a lot of news that you've been covering lately at libertarianinstitute.org slash news the top of the pile here democrats attack ukraine audit resolution as divisive and ill-advised and this goes to um matt gates who as we speak actually is uh, preparing to uh introduce and i guess he's already introduced they're going to debate and vote on a somalia withdrawal uh, war powers resolution today wish we'd had a little bit more notice about that but anyway um same guy making some America first anti-war positions, uh, part of, you know, his main, uh, kind of, uh, political brand now. And, um, so I guess, first of all, tell us about his audit resolution and then these ridiculous Democrats trying to stop him. Yeah. So this, the, the bill number is H res 300. And this is similar to something that, uh, Gates introduced in the last Congress, but, you know, this is something really great that Representative Gates has been doing. Uh, he's introduced a lot of legislation in the Congress, and he's used some legislative tools. And this particular uh, piece of legislation is privileged, and so uh, apparently that means it's going to get a vote, and at least in the committee. And I believe that's going to happen on Friday. If the debate on Wednesday is any indication, it looks like it's going to pass, Scott. They uh, passed out a committee, at least. There was a vo voice vote in the committee, and uh, it passed with all Republicans for it and the Democrats against no it. No way, huh? Okay. Yeah, so uh, Daryl Issa and Corey Mills, who, you know, uh, Representative Mills is a Republican from Florida who I have an article that I wrote at the Libertarian Institute how this guy is terrible on Yemen. But he is uh, pretty solid on some foreign policy issues, and particularly the war in Ukraine. He uh, brought up the uh, the fact that there's could be mission creep going on with the amount of activity the U.S. troops are doing in Ukraine, and that the White House isn't providing enough information to Congress uh, for them to decide if you you know the White House has really gone to war or not. And he even used the phrase mission creep and said that he had been a part of mission creep when he was a soldier. Uh, he named a couple African countries and then. Uh, uh, Afghanistan as well. Uh, so he he was supportive of it. ISA was supportive of it. The Democrats were against it, particularly Representative Kathy Manning, who went on a tirade about this bill, calling it divisive and ill-advised. She said it was a partisan political ploy and the height of legislative irresponsibility that jeopardizes the national security of the United States, our European allies and partners, as well as the courageous uh, your Ukrainian people. Um, now, one other interesting thing is that she mentions that the, the reason that this is so problematic is because it could divide the congressional consensus that support for Ukraine must be unwavering and indefinite. And she said measures like this put bipartisanship in jeopardy. And so, you know, they really don't want to have any debate about this, Scott, and that's essentially what they're worried about. And another thing that Democrats brought up is that they're worried that this intelligence is going to get out, which is laughable considering that a whole bunch of, you know, highly classified documents just leaked out in the White House as, you know, they, they – the, they're taking the leak seriously, but they've downplayed the importance of the information that has come out through the leads. And also, ISA pointed out that this information is only going to go to the House Select Intelligence Committee and is not going to be released to the general public. And so that that kind of, you know, goes against the arguments made by the Democrats in this committee hearing. Yeah. All right. Now, um, I think it's funny. I have to note that the irresponsibility part 
This is the height of legis not just irresponsibility, but legislative irresponsibility to try to count where the money is going. Yes. Um, and we yeah, also had uh, Representative all Ger uh, Gerald Conley say that, you know, we, we need to have oversight, Scott, but this is not the appropriate time for oversight. <laughs> and of course, you know, we've heard testimony uh, in Congress even from the Special Investigative General for Afghan Reconstruction, John Sopko, who's basically said, if you don't have oversight now, you're never going to be able to have it. And you don't know where the, the weapons are ending up. And further, there was... Um, Someone from a, a pretty mainstream think tank who recently went to Ukraine and said that the problem isn't that the weapons aren't arriving in the country. It's that Ukraine can't get them from, you know, the arms depots to where they actually need them on the battlefield. It's just logistical problems. Mm -hmm. um, well, oh, I didn't really realize that. I thought, in fact, part of the story was it was surprising how little Russia had done to bomb bridges and so forth throughout Ukraine to prevent the transfer of those weapons. What's the holdup? I, I imagine it's communication. It's, you know, everybody's probably asking for the weapons and then actually figuring out where they're needed in the battle and getting them to those soldiers. And also, mm -hmm. you know, things getting siphoned off along the way as well. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, commanders taking in arms and then selling them and things like that. I've also read reports that essentially there's a ghost soldier problem in Ukraine right now where. You know, commanders are collecting paychecks uh, for soldiers that aren't actually fighting are there. Uh -huh. That was funny. I was just uh, talking with Danny Davis and I said to him, yeah, I knew for sure in Afghanistan that they had these ghost soldiers that didn't even exist and all this and that. And I know less about what's going on in Ukraine. So it's interesting to note that they're pulling the same scam here. Uh, just incredible. And of course, as Seymour Hersh is reporting, the CIA director went over there and told Zelensky, hey, man, you better cool it on some of this stuff. And he said that was what was behind the roundup and the anti-corruption, uh, you know, uh, persecutions of all of his, you know, best guys um, a few months ago, which is believable, I guess. Um, it didn't seem like he was really going after his enemies. Somebody was making him clean house. That makes sense. Um and and it must have been a superior outside force like the director of central intelligence. Boy, you know you're corrupt when the CIA director is telling you to cool it. Oh, man. Um, all right, now, I like this headline, too. This is really important. U.S. ambassador blasts Hungary's call for ceasefire in Ukraine as cynical. So, first of all, what was it that the terrible, terrible NATO ally um, Viktor Orban said? Yeah, so this was said last month. Uh, Victor Orban tweeted out a video and then a couple quotes from it. And one of the quotes on Twitter is, Russia cannot win because the entire Western world has lined up behind Ukraine. At the same time, Russia is a nuclear power and nuclear powers cannot be cornered because they may trigger a nuclear war. We need to put ceasefire and peace talks the sooner the better. And then he continued, Ukraine is fighting viol uh, valiantly and they have our full sympathy, but the only thing that can save the lives in the Ukraine war is a ceasefire. And then it's the U.S. ambassador to Hungary, David Pressman, who said that uh, that call was is cynical to call for a ceasefire when it's not your country that is almost 20 percent occupied by a foreign invading army. The United States wants peace. One thing is just and lasting. And that is precisely why we are standing shoulder to shoulder with the victims with Ukraine. And so you know, we, we hear from Pressman essentially the same thing that we've you know really gotten from the White House since the start of this war, Scott, is that they wanted to keep going and they're making impossible demands for it to end. Yeah. I mean, this is what I was just talking with uh, Daniel Davis about is how this is what's revealed in the leaks is that they've been lying. They keep saying that there is a Ukrainian army that could ever possibly take back all of its land and including Crimea, which... Just as Orban is saying here, a total victory on Ukraine's side, if it could be achieved, could lead to a nuclear war. So there has to be, and he's right too, that all of NATO is behind Ukraine's side. So, I mean, Davis thinks that, you know, maybe they can hold some territory, but that they're in no position to launch an offensive right now. Now would be a good time to try to call a ceasefire leave the lines where they are instead of getting further and further behind. 
But um, meanwhile, they're telling us, just like they told us for 20 years, no, we're building a strong and functional Afghan national army and state to support it, which they have a state there already. But um, they can just tell yeah. us whatever they want. doesn't really matter if it's true, I guess. And I guess we'll see when the spring or early summer or whatever it is now offensive finally does come if it does. And, you know, Dave DeCamp had a great article this week pointing out that the White House is uh, seem, seeming to starting to prepare that that offensive might not plan out and uh, it might not go the way they want, which is obvious from the 50 plus documents that we've now seen that Jad Teixeira leaked or allegedly leaked uh, onto Discord, where, you know, these the show that Ukraine doesn't have very much air defenses, that they're uh, military size isn't what they thought it'd be. And uh, there's a lot of problems going on in the Ukrainian military that strongly suggest that that this offensive is not going to work out uh, for Ukraine. And yeah, you know, kind of like what Orban says, Scott, is, you know, if you have an offensive that's going to fail, the way to save the lives of the Ukrainian people is to call a ceasefire now, because all they're going to do is lose more territory if they can't take any back. Yeah. All right. So, Zelensky finally took a call from Xi Jinping. So what happened there? Yeah, so I, I guess uh, so Dave DeCam covered this for us at antiwar.com. And I, I mean, it looks somewhat promising here. Zelensky called the uh, call meaningful. He said, I had a long and meaningful phone call with President Xi. I believe that this call, as well as the appointment of Ukraine's ambassador to China, will give powerful impetus for the development of our bilateral relations. Uh, I think Russia didn't respond particularly favorably to the idea that there's going to be some kind of negotiated settlement, even with, you know, China's involvement here. Uh, but at the same time, you know, Zelensky even suggesting the idea that peace could be achieved, I think, is a good thing. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I want to talk with you about. Well, actually, let me put that up for a second. Um, nah, well, yeah, I guess l let's talk about the cluster bombs. As long as we're committing atrocities here, what's this? So we have had calls in the past. Uh, last, or I think at the end of February, we had the four leaders of the you know more foreign policy committees of the House and the Senate, uh, a Republican. So uh, that is Representative Mike Rogers, and then Jim Inhofe, uh, Michael McCall, and Roger Wickers all calling for Biden to transfer these uh, cluster bombs to Ukraine. And of course, cluster bombs are uh, weapons that drop sub like bomblets, like little sub munitions. And a lot of times these don't explode. And so, you know, looking back at Lebanon from 2006 or the Vietnam War, there's millions of these bomblets that still haven't been uh, found and uh, tens uh, of thousands of people have been injured by them in, in Laos and in Vietnam, and particularly uh, children are susceptible to them with, I think, like 40% of, of all injuries uh, caused by these bomblets uh, occur to children. So thousands of children have been injured just from the legacy of the Vietnam War. After the war ended, tens of thousands of children in the, those countries have killed been killed too. Uh, yeah, it, you know, maimed and killed by, by these bombs. And so uh, the U.S. has three million of them, according to uh, Representative Rogers, and he wants those sent to Ukraine because if not, the U.S. is going to have to destroy them at, uh, you know, our own at spend. So he's like, ah, oh, the best thing to do with them is just to send them to Ukraine, which is some pretty terrifying logic yeah. uh, if we're just going to dump our weapons <laughs> there that we don't want anymore. Yeah, well, you know, I mean— um... I'm almost certain this is in American Holocaust, where the guy testifies to Congress, the officer testifies to Congress, the congressman's like, why are you bombing Laos like this? You just keep bombing them, bombing them, bombing them. And he goes, well, they keep sending me bombs. So I have to use them or they'll pile up on the tarmac, you know? So yeah. it, it's nothing about there are targets and tactically and operationally, they're part of our strategy. Nope. Just, well, geez, Congressman, I got this inventory and I got to get rid of it. What am I going to do? Send it back to D.C.? Yeah. Um, so there you go. That's how uh, Laotians got bombed. So, yeah. Um, we got to do something with them. We got to kill somebody with them or they're just going to go to waste, Kyle. <laughs> um, all right. Now, right. yeah, it's going to cost us money to destroy them. So we got to spend a whole bunch of money getting them to Ukraine. Yeah, exactly. And then. 
from there, the costs are on others. So who cares? Um, all right. Now, let's talk about your uh, viewpoints section at antiwar.com here because you got some really important ones. First of all, the George Beebe article I read this morning, Time for Biden to Come Clean on Ukraine. What'd you like about that article so much that you decided to run it? Yeah, so this is a little bit like what we were talking about before, Scott, where the Biden administration has put forward a you know, fake narrative about the war in Ukraine, how it's going to the American public, suggesting that, you know, this war could be one that, you know, Ukraine was going to have a spring offensive that would be successful. Uh, you know, they talked about breaking the land bridge uh, between uh, Russia proper and the Crimean Peninsula. So the Zaporizhia and Kershaw Oblast in southern Ukraine, uh, taking those back and then entering into negotiations. Well, it really appears, Scott, and what we've learned from the Teixeira elites, that that's not what this is, that that's not going to happen, that the the, you've, the offensive isn't going to be successful. And so, you know, the Biden administration should come to clean to the American people and let us know how poorly this war is going for Ukraine, especially, uh, you, you know, we should look on the horizon here, Scott. Uh, the aid is probably going to run out that Congress approved in December that I think it was about $40 billion or 30 something billion dollars in aid. They said the White House could send to Ukraine. That's, I, I think, going to be depleted in the next couple of months. And so, you know, debate's going to come out again. And uh, hopefully the Biden administration is honest with the American people by then, or else we could really escalate this war uh, that Ukraine is continuing to lose. Yeah. Hey, guys, Scott here for Leo Hamill Fine Jewelers out of San Diego at JewelryStoreSD.com. They do business nationwide. They sell jewelry and watches, specializing in engagement rings. You know, in case you're in love with somebody. They also specialize in one-of-a-kind vintage and antique jewelry Fully serviced pre-owned fine watches such as Rolex, Patek, Philippe, Cartier, and any high-end brand. Leos also services high-end watches faster and cheaper than going to a factory service center. Leos takes all the stress out of shopping for jewelry and engagement rings, and always at the right price. They deal nationwide over the phone at 619-299-1500. That's Leo Hamill Fine Jewelers out of San Diego. Go to JewelryStoreSD.com to check out their fine selection and to find out more. Hey, y'all, you should sign up for my Substack. It's ScottHortonShow.Substack.com. And if you do that, you'll get the interviews a day before everybody else. But not only that, they'll be free of commercials. How do you like that? Pretty good, huh? ScottHortonShow.Substack.com. Hey, y'all, LibertasBella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things, including the great Top Lobsters designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella, from the same great folks who bring you Ammo.com for all your ammunition needs, too. That's LibertasBella.com. Um, well, that's just cynical to say that we should... Stop supporting a war that can't be won, that if it could, could lead to a nuclear war. I mean, geez, what's your problem? But anyway, that's, you know, I guess I could move to D.C. now that I got my talking points straight. Um, all right, well, who's this Bovard character and what's he write about here? Yeah, so James Bovard is uh, with us at the Libertarian Institute. This particular article is at the Future of Freedom Foundation, and uh, he's going over the Assange uh, prosecution and particularly uh, the, the Biden administration's responsibility in that obviously it's Trump that, uh, you, you know, during his administration that he first gets arrested, but the Biden administration has gone along with it. And uh, Bovard is breaking that down and talking about, of course, why Julian Assange is a hero. Oh, yeah, that's great. All right. Now, listen, um, I confess that I am not doing a good enough job keeping up with all the China stuff. But I'm glad that you and Patrick and Dave and everybody else over there at antiwar.com and the Institute are. So you're kind of picking up my slack. I just get to claim credit for what you guys are doing. Um, a little. But that doesn't mean I'm learning everything that you guys are learning. Because I'm busy writing a history book about this other stuff on the other side of the planet. So um, why don't you uh, tell me about this piece by Caitlin Johnstone and uh, Australia and their role in American China policy over there. 
Yeah, so this is a really great article by Caitlin Johnstone, and she's an Australian, of course, and she's just going over how uh, with the U.S. military buildup towards China, one of the things they're really trying to do is rope all of the countries that generally surround China, although Australia is still part, pretty far away uh, from mainland China, but still, you know, the India, Australia, Japan, the Philippines, uh, South Korea, all these countries the U.S. is really trying to rally to be more confrontational towards China. And Australia has agreed to do a major military overhaul to get there. There's going to be American uh, military officers embedded in that process. And at the very end of the article, she has this fantastic line about, you know, the U.S. empire should just annex Australia as a 51st state already. That way we get a pretend vote in America's elections. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, there was a joke about the Israelis uh, making them the 51st state, but then they would only have two senators and that wouldn't be a good deal for them. But anyway, uh, Senator jokes. Um, all right. So when, what's the latest out of there? You know, I didn't get a chance to ask Danny Davis. I ran out of time, but he had written about all these war games and things. And it just seems like there's real escalation on all sides. Yeah. Or not. In particular, there, there's this new committee in Congress who's looking at the China threat and it's led by Representative, I believe his first name is Mike Gallagher. And uh, Representative Gallagher recently participated in some war games uh, that were led by CNAS. And of course, Scott, the war games scared the pants off all the congressmen. And now they say we need to arm uh, Taiwan to the teeth. And, you know, they're, they're talking about massive military buildups in the region. Uh, so, you know, I think this is probably something that's going to happen more because it seems like it, it was fairly successful where they're going to start involving more Congress in these war games to make them feel really afraid and like they really have to do something about China. Now, did you look into those war games in detail? Because I believe that Danny Davis wrote that you know, they did it a few different times um, at this think tank, uh, CSIS, I guess, ran one. And they're the Hawks, too. And we lost two aircraft carriers in each time that they did it. They said, we won. But we lost hundreds, like 700 planes. And, you know, the two carriers were the only ones that he mentioned there. But presumably that meant we lost a bunch of destroyers and whatever else, too, out there. And I wonder, because I can see how if you're a hawk at a, you know, Raytheon funded think tank and your job is to scare Congress into giving Raytheon more money to build more weapons to take on China, then that's fine. But it seems like they might scare them too much. And, you know, by doing a realistic war game and showing these people that, look, what are you going to do about their missile barrage, man? They got hypersonic missiles. They can sink your carriers. So you still willing to really lose carriers that you have no defense for, you know? Um, it seems like, you know, maybe that could end up working in our favor a little bit, although it doesn't sound like it is. But so that I, seems I imagine, to be how bad it is, right, in those war games. So I would guess, Scott, that there's probably a minority of congressmen who do look at that. And, and you know, maybe isn't somebody like Representative Cory Mills might be a good example because he was in the military and say, you know, geez, that is a lot of sailors and this is a real problem to overcome. And, uh, you know, maybe the, the solution here is to look at diplomat settlement. But I don't think most congressmen think that far about it. And look, if the war games came out, Scott, and, you know, they're like, oh, America could soundly defeat you, China in a war then why would you increase defense spending? Why would you increase military and war spending then? You, you know, you're not going to do it. And so, uh, you know, my guess is that not only is a part of the the congressional education here about the war games, you know, they're, they're holding the war games for them, but then I'm sure at the end they say, so if we want to change the, the end of, the, you know, how this plays out, we have to do, you know, buy and develop these new weapons platforms that could do A, B, C, and D. And, Congress takes marching orders, Scott. They don't they don't think deeply. Well, yeah, you got that right. Um, all right. Well, so what are the bad news you want to talk about today? So 
There is a uh, really good article that we have as the spotlight at antiwar.com today by Ted Galen Carpenter, who uh, is now with us at antiwar.com and the Libertarian Institute. So that's really awesome because, uh, as I, I think I mentioned on your show a couple times, Scott, I think uh, Ted Galen Carpenter, along with Ted Snyder, had maybe been the most important uh, American writers over the past two years as America has moved towards uh, war with Russia and you know is now in the full-on proxy war. Uh, but Ted goes through here and just points out how the the mainstream media has absolutely failed the American people. You, you know, we we talked about the George Beebe article, how the uh, Biden administration needs to come clean with the American people. Well, as Ted points out, we really now had the documents. You know, they're they're highly classified or whatever, but we know that this you know war is not going to plan, and the mainstream media could inform the American people about it, and they're simply choosing not to. And, you, you know, we've had some other developments in the recent weeks, like uh, a congresswoman threatening Matt Taibbi uh, over information that he didn't even get wrong. Um, you know, things like this going on, the suppression of the Seymour Hersh reporting on Facebook. They were simply blocking people from sharing the story altogether. Of course, I couldn't check that out for myself because I am banned from Facebook. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's just so much crackdown and. Uh, so and much remind us again, which story was it that find, nothing. remind us which story was it that got you kicked off of there? Uh, so I believe I, they never told me for sure. I believe it was my coverage of the Shireen Abu Akhle uh, murder uh -huh. where the Israeli soldiers uh, shot her in, in the face last year as she was trying to cover one of their raids. Uh, I guess that was maybe two years ago now, actually, as she was trying to cover one of the raids. So. That was a terrible story, and I, I covered a lot of that, including uh, the Israelis showing up at her funeral and trying to, like, take the coffin and uh, beat the pallbearers and things like that. Man, that was crazy. Um, and it's funny because I know you and anybody listening, whoever uh, watches your show or reads your stuff or listens to your show or reads your stuff, we all know that you'd have never broken the terms of service by saying anything inflammatory or that kind of thing. You're just covering an inflammatory story was all. And yeah, they got no, you for I, it. I, I feel like I'm pretty reserved on social media most of the time. I'm, of course. I don't go anywhere near as far as you do by taking on these uh, terrible people online and giving them the treatment they deserve. And uh, I still end up getting banned. Yeah. Well, lucky for me, I just quit Facebook. As soon as they changed the algorithm to try to force me to pay to have my things seen by anyone, I just quit. Screw you guys. I'm going home. I don't need any of this. I mean, I still have a page that friends run for me, but uh, I haven't even logged into it in forever. Um, goodbye. But yeah, and then that, that was a huge one, right? Is they're suppressing the Seymour Hearst story. And you know... I mean, if you suppressed a David Sanger story, I'd probably still be a little bit upset. And I hate David Sanger, you know. But uh, Seymour Hersh, not only is he a legendary investigative reporter, but he used to work for the New York Times. You know what I mean? It's not like he's even, in other words, even if you accepted the censorship regime against alternative media on some basis that only mainstream media tells the truth, does that sound right? Uh, well, he's mainstream enough, you know? He's the probably the most accomplished investigative journalist in American history. <laughs> and they're just going to say, nah, yeah, we don't like his story about the pipeline, and they're going to have Facebook censor the thing? This is why Julian Assange is in jail right now. So he can't receive the leak from inside Facebook explaining what the hell is going on with that, huh? Well, you know, not only that, Scott, but they just, you know, smear Seymour Hirsch if they bring it up at all. You know, they'll say something like the once legendary reporter who repeated uh, conspiracy theories about Syria, <laughs> which what they're talking about there is him getting right what happened at Khan Sheikhoun. Right. That like that's one of the most important things, because Donald Trump used a fake chemical weapons attack to launch airstrikes against Syria, the government of Syria, which, in my view, could have been the thing that the Democrats could have impeached him for. But rather, they, you know, go with the, the narrative that allows Trump to bomb Syria and then they smear Seymour Hersh for getting it right. Yeah, that's so funny. Conspiracy theories. Yeah, really. Um, 
That's funny because we got multiple sources from intelligence and military sources that said that the Russians had called them on the deconfliction line and told them two weeks before, we're going to bomb this place. You guys should know. We know that's true. They're lying. They always lie. Um, and uh, yeah, you know what? As Hirsch pointed out on my show when I talked to him, I think he said it on my show. It might have been one of these other interviews. But uh, he said, yeah, no, when I came out with the torture story, they said it was a conspiracy theory. But General Taguba wrote a report, so oops. I say his name right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not much of a conspiracy theory when you got a two-star in charge of investigating it. But anyway, um, you know, that's what they always do. Um, all right, well... Uh, I don't know. I'm starving, man. I'm going to go have lunch. Thanks for doing the show today. You're great. Absolutely, Scott. Have a good one, man. You too. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSRadio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.